Well, I can use my classroom voice now. All right, well, thanks so much, folks. I, I really, really appreciate the, uh, you know, we talk about Southern hospitality in regards to the generic Southern United States hospitality. I can tell you, Southern University hospitality truly epitomizes to me that idea of Southern hospitality. Thank you very much, and I want to particularly thank the Chancellor here and his administrative team uh, for spending all this time with me, hauling me around. And I had the privilege of meeting a number of just outstanding students. I was you know, very uh, impressed this morning. We started off with that, and then uh, I had the privilege of uh, interacting with uh, your university administrators and the commitment that uh, they've made to support the efforts of the, uh, the agricultural enterprise. And, uh, and then I had the privilege of uh, you know, uh, listening to some faculty presentations and also walking through some of the labs. And I tell you, I tip my hat to all of you. You're doing a tremendous job. And I can go back home to Washington, D.C., knowing full well that the investments that we make as a federal agency, uh, that it is being put to good use and will continue to be put to good use, particularly in regards to our young people, the future of our nation as well. And uh, so this afternoon, what I want to do is, uh, do I have to do that? Turn it off, you went to get it. You went to get it, don't you? That means I'm going to be stuck here. <laughs> <laughs> when he gets to the remote, I'll walk around. No, no, you don't need to do that. Don't worry about it. Well, listen, I'm just going to turn this up off. Okay, so apparently I'm going to be stuck at this lectern. And uh, this afternoon, what I want to do is, uh, you know, share with you the thoughts that uh, we have developed in the, at NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and uh, about really, truly, this 21st century systems that we need, these transformative innovations that we need to ensure that we can feed the world. And so, you know, over the next about uh, half hour or 45 minutes or so, I'm going to walk through several slides and give you sort of a 30,000 foot view of, uh, and then you can garner from it the priorities that we've set, we're gonna be, we have set and we'll be setting as well. So as you faculty members and students, by the way, in future, as you write grant proposals and things like that, you might want to start thinking, how do I frame the argument to get the kind of funding that you need for your work from us as well? In addition to the funding that we provide you through various programs, we refer to them as the Evans Allen Funding, 1890s extension, capacity building grants, facilities grants, and things like that. We offer a whole slew of competitive grants as well. And I'd encourage you to really think very seriously about it. And then during the Q&A session, you know, hopefully you'll have a chance to ask me some questions as well. Oh, you got it? Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. That way, I don't need to be hanging around here. Uh, all right, so. <clears throat> to what I refer to as nutritional security. 
And oh, by the way, a lot of folks end up using the term food security. And several years ago, as, you know, as I was thinking about it, I morphed into utilizing the term nutritional security. In part, because it's not just food, as in calories, that we need. In fact, it's the calories that we consume that's contributed to some of the problems we see in this state, across America. Some of our faculty here are working on in regards to obesity and people being overweight and things like that. And uh, so I morphed into using the term nutritional security because we have to make sure that the food that people consume does result in positive health outcomes. And what we have is two bookends of a situation in regards to this nutritional security issue that we've got, this existential threat that we've got. On the one hand, we've got people that are dropping dead because of too much food, and I'll come back to that in just a second. And on the other hand, globally, we've got people dropping dead for lack of food. Both things are happening. And that's why I call it an existential threat. Right now, it's happening right now. Not something that's gonna happen in the year 2050 or beyond. In the year 2050 and beyond, is going to be a lot worse, much, much worse, in part because we've got what I refer to as the perfect storm. I don't know if some of you recognize it, but that's Katrina, by the way. Perfect storm. And the perfect storm is really being driven by the population explosion that we've got. Because populations are increasing and they continue unabated, and we're going to, we, you know, projections are we're going to have about uh, 9.7 to 10 billion people in just the next about 25 to 30 years. That's the number that we're going to have. And uh, <clears throat> this perfect storm, as a result of this increasing population, is everything from climate change. I mean, the, the, the intensity of the hurricanes that we're seeing today, the number of hurricanes that we're seeing today, the floods that we saw last year, for example, in this part of the country, the droughts that we've seen in the Midwest and in California, the extreme weather events. You know, back in the good old days, uh, maybe the Chancellor and I remember, in, you know, in the good old days here, on television, if you remember, uh, you know, uh, the tornado season in America, which usually happens around April, May or so, would have a movie that would be shown on television. Do y'all remember what movie that is? Click your heels three times and... Uh, yeah. huh? <laughs> Pardon me? The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz, yeah. The Wizard of Oz, if you remember that movie, if you've seen the movie, by the way, apparently the students here don't see too many movies. They don't see study. <laughs> uh, the Wizard of Oz is uh, a movie that is typically shown in the month of May in America, April, May, typically. Because that's when tornado season is, used to be. And now tornado season pretty much around the year. It starts in January, goes through December. And we're seeing hurricanes, that used to be the hurricane season, happening around the year as well. And the hurricanes are very intense. The storm systems that we're getting are very intense. The rainfall that we're getting are at the wrong time. So I was driving through uh, last year on Interstate 70 through Kansas. And in the month of April, the wheat field looked like a rice paddy. And if you see pictures of rice paddies, there's a lot of water, the rice seedlings are growing in there, it looked just like a rice paddy. And so that poor plant that was stuck in there was flooded. Wheat, not rice, but wheat. And then I was back there, again driving on the same interstate stretch in the month of uh, June, July. It was bone dry, there were cracks in the soil. And that poor plant had to deal with the bone dry environment later on in the season and the flooding early in the season. And yet, it made a pretty good crop, by the way. And, you know, humans, you and I, if it gets too hot or too cold, we can get up and move. But plants cannot do that. They're stuck in space and time. So they're stuck there, and we've got to figure out how best to do this as well. So we've got a whole bunch of things that are going on. There's, you know, with the increasing populations, with more and more people coming along, we had to build more cities, we had to build more towns, we, you know, they're being built our own bodies of water, and the cities and towns are competing for water, as is agriculture as well. So who's going to make that decision as to who's going to get that water first? Right? In countries like China and India, where you've got increasing urbanization, here in America, we're about 85% of our population is urban. In 
uh, China, and India, and, and countries in Africa, it's just they're right around about uh, anywhere from 30 to about 60 percent urban. In just another 10 to 15 years, they're going to be about 80 to 85 percent urban as well. And so the competition for land to build cities and the competition for land to raise crops is going to become not much more intense. And along with that, we've got you know uh, conflicts and migration. We've seen this happening here in, from the Middle East. People are getting up and moving because of terrorism, because of conflicts, of wars, and things like that. They're moving to Europe, moving to America. You know, 90,000 people last week set out uh, from the coast of Africa, and many of them died along the way wanting to get to uh, uh, Italy and to Portugal and Spain and other places. And we've got globalization and trade that's going on. Because of the globalization of trade, we're getting new kinds of insects and pathogens and weeds coming in. In fact, some of you may have heard of the emerald ash borer, and you probably heard of me, and, and, you know, hog head over there, have lots of trees for you to uh, convert to biofuels. <laughs> Just in Michigan alone, emerald ash borer that came from China in pallets. You know, we import a lot of stuff from China. They come in those pallets, and uh, they destroyed 30 million trees. Just in Michigan. And then you add, now it's now spread to, throughout uh, into Virginia and uh, Kentucky and in the Appalachians. Now it's crossed over into the Mississippi, uh, crossed over the Mississippi into Iowa and the other places heading out to, you know, California and other places as well. It's destroying trees in its wake. Okay, we have the emerald ash borer, the Asian longhorn beetle. We've got pathogens, for example, in May of uh, April of last year, April of a year ago, in Kentucky, in a wheat crop, wheat seedlings, little bitty wheat seedlings, spring wheat that just come up. The extension person there found lesions on the leaves. It was a disease. So he thought it was a particular disease. He called one of the world's experts on this particular disease. Her name is Barbara Valent. She's at Kansas State University. She flies out to Kentucky and determines that it is a wheat blast disease. It's a particularly scary proposition for us, collectively. So, this, she takes the samples, sends them to Rockville, Maryland, to the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service to be tested, DNA testing. There's a confirmation, and once the confirmation is done, they literally burn that field in Kentucky. Because you want to stop it. It turns out the wheat glass is from Bolivia. Okay, and I'll tell you the speculation on how we may have come here in just a second. And then in the month of May, she gets a call from the U.S. Agency for International Development to go to Bangladesh. She flies out there. She finds the same disease on wheat in Bangladesh. The difference is, through the rest of the year, into 2017, that disease has spread throughout the Indian subcontinent, in India, Pakistan, and, and Bangladesh. Their wheat crop is going to be completely destroyed. They're not going to be able to have a wheat crop that will import wheat from America, from Russia, and other places as well. Okay? The difference is, here in America, we what's referred to as the National Plant Diagnostic Network that we provide funding to. They went, Barbara Valent went and found it. It was destroyed completely very, very quickly. Turns out, the Bangladeshi wheat blast was also from Bolivia. Now, go figure. Bolivia is in South America. How did this happen? The speculation is, remember in the springtime, waterfowl get up and fly, geese from the southern parts of the world. And likely what happened was they ate something in Bolivia, like a grass seed or the seedling or whatever. And in it was the wheat blast disease. And they picked it up and they flew the 2,500 miles or whatever to get to Kentucky. And the first thing they do, these geese, is they got to start eating. They see the beautiful greenery of the wheat field. They land. First thing they do is to defecate. They got to dump, take a dump, and start eating. In the poop are the spores of the disease. And that's how it got spread. Okay? We speculate that even in Bangladesh, some of these birds, they take a, a diversion route, end up going to Asia and then swing back on up north. Okay? Maybe that's what happened. We don't know. Maybe somebody was traveling in Bolivia and the spores got on their shoes and they walked around and got in, in the fields. Or, God forbid, somebody used it intentionally, on purpose, wanting to destroy the crops. 
give you another story that happens and as a result of globalization and, and movement and migration and things like that. Two years ago, in America, in the upper Midwest of Minnesota and in Iowa, we got avian influenza. It was brought to us by geese heading south, okay, from the north. They brought avian influenza and we had to destroy 15 million birds. That was worth $3.5 billion for those farmers. And when you put the multiplier on it, the value added, it's about 15 to $30 billion hit for those farmers. And, oh, by the way, imagine trying to dispose of 50 million car carcasses. What do you think, Dr. Walker? That's an interesting proposition. Yeah. All this happened, again, migrating waterfowl transmitted it, people carrying these things. You know, we get influenza virus, we get all manner of things, we get bed bugs that are totally resistant to everything that came from Asia. So these things are happening as well. So when you take all that, and oh, by the way, you know, we have an anti-science environment as well. You know, people in America have been blessed with the most amazing engines of discovery, like, you know, this institution, and with the most amazing media, and yet people have an anti-science attitude, that they don't trust science. And this is not only people on the right or left of the uh, political spectrum, everybody. So you've got people like the Food Babe, some of you may have heard of the Food Babe. She has 97,000 Twitter followers and people think that what she says is all true. It's bogus. And, uh, but people believe it. And you've got the anti-vaccine lady, Jenny McCarthy, some of you may have seen her on MTV back in the old days. And she claims that if you take, you know, have your children uh, in, you know, vaccinated, they're gonna get all these diseases, including autism and things like that. Again, bogus based on false information. In fact, the paper that was published had to be retracted because it was fake. Fake data went into it. That's what's happening on the left. In fact, the wealthiest communities in America, Marin County, California, is the wealthiest county in America. Has the, one of the lowest levels of vaccination. Mississippi and Louisiana, Mississippi is probably the, the poorest state in America, has the highest level of vaccination. Okay, go figure. These things are happening as well. Oh, by the way, on the right, you've got people like Rush Limbaugh <laughs> that are spouting that, you know, climate change and all that is terrible. This is not, right, this is the government telling you falsehood and things like that. That's what's happening as well. So that's the perfect storm. So now, you, you as nutritional scientists and agricultural scientists, the work that you do that we support, you're trying to figure out how am I going to feed the world in this context of this perfect storm that we've got. That's like putting your hands behind your back, tying your hands behind your back, and trying to figure out how best you're going to feed the world, addressing this existential threat that we've got. Okay, so in thinking of how we address this, you know, particularly the food systems, the 21st century food systems, there's a whole array of things that we need to be thinking of as well. It includes everything from nutritional security to family and community to Opioids, the opioid crisis that we've got even here in Louisiana, in rural communities, because of the cheap availability of uh, these opioid drugs. People are taking it and dropping dead. In fact, it's become, opioids have become the scourge of middle-aged white people in America. The rate of people, white people dying in America committing suicide is an epidemic, they're killing themselves, okay? And there's a body of literature, Andrew Deaton is a Nobel Prize winning economist, and his wife, Anne Case, uh, they wrote this, or did this research and discovered in America, across the United States, we have people killing themselves because of the cheap availability of these opioids, okay? That's happening as well. Collectively, we have a responsibility to address that because it's about rural communities, and we provide funding. NIFA provides funding for that as well. And on to rural economic development, issues pertaining to veterans' needs. We have you know, over two million veterans that have come back to America as a result of the continuing wars in the Middle East, in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and other places as well. And these are young people, unemployment amongst our veterans, 
is between 10 and 25 percent. And they, many of them come from rural communities, from poor communities. How do we go ahead and make sure? It's not enough for us to send them out to go fight a war for us to protect our freedoms. But when they come back, it's important that we need to provide them the opportunity to engage in economic opportunities as well. And they've got mental health issues, PTSD. They've got uh, physical health issues. Again, my agency, NIFA, provides funding for that as well. So Southern universities are, are interested in working with veterans. You might look at us because we provide funding for beginning farmers and ranchers uh, and the veterans community as well. And we have all these things. But today, what I want to do this afternoon, you let me, might be back on the the other topics. Uh, I'll speak to only the nutritional security part of it. Just one topic that I would like to speak to. And uh, so to me, and to you as well, we should all think about this. At the core should be the farmers and livestock producers. That's who should be at the core. Anything and everything that we do has to be those individuals. And I'll talk about consumers as well in just, in just a few minutes. The unfortunate thing is that those producers are caught in a vice grip of a whole bunch of uh, non-living <coughs> factors, abiotic factors, everything from you know, global warming and climate change to droughts and the intense weather events and labor issues and immigration, all of these uh, regulations and policies and things like that are all the non-living constraints that prevent farmers from doing what they need to be doing, which is produce food. And they also have issues with living constraints. The insects and the pathogens and the weeds and other things as well. So literally they're getting getting crushed. And it's incumbent on you to think of when you're doing the research that you're doing, as animal scientists, or, as forestry folks, or as economists, or nutrition folks, or whatever, think of putting that farmer smack dab in the middle of what you end up doing. The funding that we're providing is all about the folks in the middle there. That's what it's all about. Okay? It is. We're the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and that's what we're supporting. And I'd like for you to think about, about that as well. As you're writing your grant proposals and submitting to us, think of all the broader context as well, particularly as it comes to, as, as it uh, pertains to the uh, producers that we have. I don't want to leave you, particularly the young people here, thinking, oh my gosh, you know, the world is shot, and, and you know, we're all going to go to hell. We're not going to be able to uh, feed the world. And this is terrible. All these, you know, old folks uh, have done this to us. And what are we going to do about it? You know, I'm the optimist. I'm the eternal optimist. And in looking at uh, the various inventions and discoveries, and this starts off only about 10,000 years before the common era. That means it's about 12,000 years ago. And then you come across all the way to the present. And look at there's just a small subset of inventions and discoveries and innovations that people like yourselves have come up with across the globe. Everything from the invention of actually domesticating crops and domesticating animals, like cows and wheat and rice and sugarcane and other things that we did, our ancestors did, in many, many parts of the world, including in this part of the world. Along with that, we have the first use of uh, biological control methods first use of fertilizers, on to the creation of the Morrill Act, or the, the Langback University. In my mind, that's an invention that is a seminal invention. No other country in the world has been able to do it, is the invention of the Langback University, like Southern University, to be able to address the challenge of that. Along with that, we've got, you know, Gregor Mendel, the geneticist, who figured out using peas, pea plants, figured out heritability. How do genes get inherited? from the male parent and the female parent. To, in the 1950s, it, by the way, today is the anniversary of the publication of the article by Watson and Crick on the structure of DNA. Okay, that was a seminal uh, discovery as well. On to, you know, we come in later on, we got the creation of the transgenic crops, GMOs, genetically modified crops, and things like that, and there you go. We got uh, sequencing, genomic sequencing, and all the, the tools that uh, some of your folks are using here on campus. So today, we've got the Internet of Things. Every probably everybody here has something like this in their pockets, or maybe something like this on their wrist, and their laptops and and uh, you know iPads and computers and all that. 
Everything is interconnected. Our, our automobiles, if you've purchased your automobile in the last two or three years, it's connected to the internet. Everything is interconnected. It's called the internet of things. Your refrigerator is connected. Your, in fact, some of you may have heard uh, a woman that were, uh, you know, uh, somebody talking about microwave ovens spying on you. I'm sure some of you heard that too. They do. They do. I'm not kidding you. Your televisions are spying on you. There's no doubt about it. Because everything is interconnected. Okay? That's the internet of things. And in fact, in the agricultural arena, if you sit in a combine today, it's like sitting in a, a jet airplane. And they have, you know, everything is computer controlled. And uh, you punch in the coordinates, and those things will go perfect straight lines, you know, back and forth and back and forth. You just kind of kick back and relax this air conditioning. You can have a cold beer or something like that. <laughs> and, and, you know, not even uh, uh, sweat. <laughs> sweat. <laughs> okay, those are the inventions and discoveries. That's what we've done. Humanity has done. So I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able to address this, this existential threat that we've got. And oh, by the way, here is uh, an example of what has happened that humanity did. This right here, that's an American quarter. And this right little grain head is Teosinte. T-E-O-S-E-N-T-E. -E -E. It's the ancestor of modern corn. And the people in Mesoamerica, these Native Americans in Mexico, in the highlands of Mexico in Michoacan, they saw those things and thought, hmm, it's got some grain in it. And they popped it open, little bitty grain, you hardly can chew on it. You hardly get anything out of it. And it's smaller than the size of a mustard seed, you know, really, really tiny. And you don't get anything out of it. But they figured out how to select from that plant breeding. Your chancellor, by the way, is a breeder. You didn't sweet potatoes, if you don't know it, check it out. Okay. From there, they made these. And there's the American border. And that's a corn. You're a corn that you and I would recognize. You know, I would not recognize this guy right here. That's what those Indians did from here to here. And then, so if you look at the timeline from about uh, 1860, right? You know, the yields were just about 20, 22, 23 bushels per acre. That's all. And then you're coming to the 1930s and 1940s. That's when scientists at Iowa State University Purdue University, uh, University of Illinois, the Agricultural Research Service, they figured out how to hybridize corn. Hybrid vigor. Hello. Yo, oh, my bad. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I got carried away. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> do, do you want me to repeat myself? No, I won't repeat Okay, all right. No worries. So they figured out how to hybridize, and suddenly now you've got Hybrid vigor kicking in. Now we're up to about 60 bushels of corn per acre. You know, three times as much as what we had previously. And then you come into the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s. That's when NIFA, predecessor agency, gave money to scientists to figure out how to use molecular tools to incorporate into grain production corn production, and suddenly now we've got exponential growth to where today our average farmer produces 180 bushels of corn. It has gone from 20 bushels of corn to 180 bushels of corn. That's a pretty mind-boggling accomplishment by humanity. Collectively, people like yourself at various places around the world. This has happened in rice, this has happened in soybeans, this has happened in various crops and cattle. If you look at dairy cattle today in America, if you go back 30 years ago and fast forward to today, we, you, we have fewer dairy cattle and more milk being produced. And so there's a smaller environmental footprint. They use less water, less feed, less greenhouse gases being produced and things like that. Imagine the possibilities that that sort of intellectual capacity that's gone into being able to make that itself. So that's the situation that we've got. And there is obviously a path forward. And again, there's a whole slew of things that need to happen. You know, a lot of the transformative discoveries and you know, extension, new extension approaches, farming systems, infrastructure, policies, regulations, and things like that. We need to 
you, I need for you to invest your capacity in all of these things. Okay? But here this afternoon, I just want to focus on this one topic only. Again, for, for lack of time. And uh, so if you look at the transformative discoveries that we need, what NIFA is trying to do is supporting you in the work that you do. Right? Our focus is we need those transformative discoveries. Absolutely positively. And when once something has been discovered, sure. For Professor Ning here, she wants to publish a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. That's the epitome, or maybe science, or nature, the epitome of scientific uh, journals. That's great for her, from her perspective as a professor, as an academic. She gets promoted, she gets recognized by somebody. I recognize her for her work, by the way. Was that last year or two years ago? Last year. Last year, okay. And uh, so, but it's only of interest to your university. You know, this guy sitting in front, he might congratulate her, oh, you got a paper, DNA, that's fantastic. But you know, the person on the street couldn't care less. A farmer couldn't care less. What they want is, what did you do for me lately? That's what it's all about. How many jobs have you created? How many fewer pounds of pesticides are you using? How many fewer people are obese as a result of the work that you do? That's what they're interested in asking as well. So uh, those discoveries need to be translated into innovations and solutions, and then delivered to the end user. It cannot be in, in a, a book or a journal that's on your bookshelf. That knowledge needs to be put to work. That's critically important for us all, absolutely positively. That's the hallmark, that's the DNA of what you do as land grant universities. When Justin Smith Morrill established land grants and the Hatch Act was passed and the Smith Lever Act was passed and the Edwards Island Act was passed, the 1890s Extension Act was passed, all of those require that you do this. Okay, we're not interested if all you do is I'm gonna publish a paper. Not interested in it. Okay? I want you to remember that. And what we do, you know, really, I like to say that the science that you undertake, that we support, is inspired by the end users. It's those poor families that you're working with. It's those children that are becoming obese that you're working with. It's those forest managers that you're working with. That's who's inspiring you to do the kind of work that you want to do. You must, you must take that into account. And once you've done the work, you've translated the knowledge into innovations and solutions and deliver it, it's transforming people's lives. That's what it's all about. At the end of the day, if you and I don't do it, then we're going to go ahead and shut our operations down and go home, do something else, okay? That's the hallmark of the work that land grant universities do. This is across the United States. And there's no other entity that does it that way, by the way. The National Science Foundation, the funding that they provide, does not take into all, not into account. Only NIFA does. NIH now does too, because they are really deeply into the National Institutes of Health, is also really into uh, translational work as well. So that's what NIFA's focus is. And uh, so, you know, we're all concerned, again, about the young people, right? And then what do we leave behind for them and the sustainability that we need to do? Anything and everything that we do, there's an interconnectedness. If you tweak one thing, if you did something in water, it might have an impact on the food we're able to produce. If you did something here, it might have an impact on climate or energy or whatever it is. So as you're thinking of deploying your intellectual capacity to addressing this existential threat of nutritional security, you might want to think of how do, you, how do you take into account all of this? What are the unintended consequences? Sure, you're focusing on the intended consequences, but what are the unintended consequences? You might, you'll have to be mindful of that as well. Because if you didn't do it, we're not gonna be able to develop the kind of sustainable systems that we need as we go forward. And when you narrow it down to the impact of agriculture on health itself, when you narrow it down there, it's even that much more critically important that we have to take into consideration these issues of this connectivity, the nexus between these different things. And how many of you read, how many of you read request for application from us? RFAs. Oh, come on, good roll you do. Okay? How many of you read our budget narrative that comes out in the president's budget over the last few years that came out in February? Okay, there's the one guy that was Another guy that put his hand up. The rest of you, shame on you. <laughs> Seriously, shame on me too. Because we provide that information to everybody. And apparently we're not doing a good job of it. 
if you are all you're doing is reading a request for application of my for funding from us or from National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health, too late. You only got a few weeks to pull together your best ideas. And remember, there's thousands of others with the, their best ideas as well. Everybody's competing. And you want to read the budget narrative that comes out with the president's budget. Over the last few years, it's always come out in the first week in February. That's when the president of the United States of America submits his budget. This year, we're a little slow. The budget narrative is going to come out in the month of May, on right around about the 20th of May or so is when it's going to come out. So you want to get on NIFA's website, look at the budget narrative for 2018, get on and an NSF website, read their budget narrative, or NIH's website, read their narrative. If you're gonna get money from Forest Service, read their narrative. If you're gonna get money from NRCS, read their narrative. Everybody has a budget narrative. Read it. It gives you a whole year's worth of advance notice of where we're gonna be putting our money. So, if you're gonna be applying for funding now from us, you should have read my budget narrative that came out in February of 2016. You'd have had a whole year to think of what it is. Pull together the teams that you want to, the best intellectual uh, capacity that you want to pull together as well. And so in the 2016 budget narrative, we articulated this idea about health, this nexus of this around animal health, plant health, environmental health, economic health, public health, they're all connected. So let's give you, give you an example or two, okay? You're interested in animal health, right? Like a walker, you're interested. You're gonna come up with, I think maybe I'm gonna give it some antibiotics. Well, if you give it antibiotics, you got antimicrobial resistance, you gotta worry about Okay? And uh, so, well, the farmer, the livestock producer now is losing money, and you got antibiotic resistance, potential. Not always, but potential, because there may be misuse or abuse of the antibiotics as well. You're a, and then, who's an entomologist here, a plant entomologist here? Anybody? She's looking for, uh, well, I guess uh, Dr. Shee is not here. She, oh, there he is, she is. Yeah, she's looking for an entomologist, a good entomologist. Yes. Yeah, or a plant entomologist. Well, if you're an entomologist or a plant entomologist, you do integrated pest management to deal with the pest. If you do that, if you're really good at it, you reduce the amount of pesticides that are being used, chemical pesticides that are being used. If that's the case, you're accruing environmental health benefits because there's fewer pesticides in the environment. Oh, by the way, the farmer can put a few more dollars in his pocket. So he or she is earning some economic benefits out of it. And the cost of his production, he can get some additional margins, as it were, a little more profit. And oh, by the way, because you got fewer pesticides in the environment, there's a public health outcome as well. As well. Imagine if you do nutrition, if you do pest management, if you do animal science, if you do agronomy, if you do whatever you're doing. Think about the health idea, that's what it is. So, grant proposal that you submit, you gotta start thinking, you know, what does the budget narrative say? How do I frame what I'm gonna do based on that, uh, that narrative that we provided? Well, and this one, you know, it really, really gives you an example, antimicrobial resistance, probiotic activity, pest detection, pest management, animal and plant health, soil health, especially about on and on and on. And there's that connectivity, all of these things. And we, you and I collectively need to be very, very mindful that we're paying attention to these issues, the health issues. Because if we don't worry about public health, then you know, we're all gonna have very significant challenges. Because again, remember in America, our healthcare costs are you know, going at a very rapid pace. Healthcare and uh, the tuition are the two things that are going at about three to five times the rate of inflation in the United States of America. So we have to be, you as, as academics, as scientists and others, and educators, you need to be thinking about it. Certainly, I do think about it. That's how we're going to be putting our money. And we're, we're very serious about it. So I would encourage you to look at the narrative. And then when you look at, go deeper down, a little bit finer grain of this connection between food and health. Going back to the social security deal, there's a spectrum. Right? As I said, people are dying to go too much food. People are dying to go too little food. And in fact, I refer to it as the billions dilemma. Tonight, We'll have about a billion people. It's only about only 850 million people, but pretty close to a billion people. That's going to go to bed hungry tonight. Pardon me. 
Um, yeah, let's try to go to that hungry time. As a result of that hunger, this is globally, as a result of that hunger, 29,000 people will drop dead globally for lack of food. Okay? At the same time tonight, oh, by the way, in America, we have 16 million households that are, going to, that are food insecure in the United States of America. We know how to feed the entire world. And yet in America, we have 16 million households. That's 15 million people that are throughout America, in cities, in rural communities, that just don't have enough food. It's crazy. The world's wealthiest nation, most powerful nation, and yet we've got a situation of not having enough food. And that's one challenge that we've got. And the bookend of it, on the other side, is 1.3 billion people globally. Tonight, we'll have to take baby aspirin for heart disease, Lipitor for cholesterol, metformin for type 2 diabetes, metformin or some other drug like that, drugs for uh, hypertension, you gotta take all that. If they don't, they're not gonna have a reasonable shot of being alive. In fact, of those 1.3 million people tonight, about 50,000 people will drop dead because of cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, and things of that nature as well. That's the, the, those are the two bookends that we've got. Oh, by the way, thinking of children. And uh, starting in the late 1800s, every generation has lived a little bit longer than the immediately preceding generation, right? To the extent where today, men and women in America live to about 80 years of age, women do, and men live to about you know, 77 or 76 years of age, approximately. Unfortunately, and that's the way it's been, every generation kept increasing, increasing, increasing. Unfortunately, children born in the first decade of this century will have a shorter lifespan than their parents. They're going to drop dead sooner than their parents because of excessive amounts of calories, sedentary lifestyle. This is particularly so amongst African Americans. This is particularly so amongst Hispanics. Particularly so amongst Native Americans. If you look at the Pima Indians in Arizona, amongst African American children, seven or eight years old, they got heart disease. They got hypertension. This is an old person's disease, not a child's disease. They got to take medication. Oh, by the way, some of these kids are unable to get up and walk because they're so overweight. They're just not able to do anything at all. And you know, uh, that has a huge impact on, on our nation, on our people. We've got to do something about it as well in thinking of this food and health spectrum that we've got in the varieties of crops that we develop, the kind of milk that we have, the kind of meat that we have. All of these need to be taken away. And, and y'all are doing some you know, pretty cool work in this area as well, with uh, the work that you're doing. And so, uh, this is completely preventable, the uh, metabolic disorders. In fact, Ursula Bauer, she's with the Centers for Disease Control. She did a study and published here in uh, 2013. She says, that 75% of America's healthcare costs, and as you know, that's the fastest growing thing. You know, we call it uh, Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and all that. And, you know, we have conversations in Congress about getting rid of it, getting something else happening. But it's going at a very rapid clip. 75% of it is attributable to chronic disease, completely preventable, like heart disease, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, some of the cancers, by the way. Dementia is a result of excessive amounts of sugars that we're consuming excessive amounts of calories that we consume as well. And completely preventable. And indeed, it turns out that obesity, the contributors, 10%, about 10, about 10 is genetics. About 10% in the microbiome, in the gut, the bugs that are in the gut. 80% almost is from the food that we consume. And again, excessive amounts of calories. That we consume. That's the challenge that we got. And so when you're thinking of uh, you know, the behaviors, the lifestyles, the food choices and things like that, what do we do working with children, you know, working with the 4-H programs, for example, working with FFA and other programs, how do we inculcate those behaviors where their children are not eating excessive amounts of food and end up having all these you know, adult onset type diseases that they have to deal with and that society has to deal with as well. So there's, you know, 
serious chronic diseases and food, hunger and food safety issues and environmental issues and things like that. It's part of that nexus as well that we need to be thinking of. And again, you know, NIFA is really interested in this nutritional security, that existential threat. How do you do it? And we're thinking it's to the farmers, but also the consumers. You can't create some food that's going to be so healthy that people won't eat it. And culturally, for example, amongst, uh, like, I was born and raised in India. And I'm a rice eater. And I like spicy foods, et cetera, right? There's a cultural aspect to it. You have the same thing amongst Hispanics. You have the same thing amongst African Americans. And, uh, you know, eating uh, 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 lard and uh, 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 fatty pig back and things like that, that type of well, fried foods and things like that. How do you, you know, it's tasty. You don't want to eat cardboard, right? I mean, you want to eat food, the cultural aspect to it as well. How do we do all that? We've got to think of it. So it's not only the fact that we're going to do some plant breeding and animal breeding. This guy's going to breed some sweet potatoes that taste like crap, you know? It's not worth it. Right? So we're going to have to really think about these as well. And in, in thinking of how do we develop these systems, now, be mindful of the ecological footprint. I'll come to that in just a second. Productivity. Make sure that the farmers can put a few more dollars in their pockets. You know, the farming enterprise is the most difficult enterprise. You may as well take your money rather than putting it into the soil. That's what you're doing as a farmer. You know, you're planting some seed, and then you're waiting and praying that a rain and the crops are going to come up and all that. You may as well go to the horse races or go to uh, the stock market. On the stock market, you have a pretty good chance of making a lot more money than you have of sticking that seed in that soil as well. How do we make it profitable? How does this college here educate young people who want to go into the farming enterprise? You know, in America, around the world, not just America, but I speak to, in America, the farming age, uh, the age of our farmers is increasing very rapidly. Right now, the average age of the far American farmer is 58.3 years of age. Fewer and fewer young people are wanting to go into the enterprise because I think, personally, I'm going to use a technical term, young people are becoming wusses. <laughs> you don't want to work in the hot sun, the cold winter. You know, you got to get, if you're a dairy farmer, you got to get up at four in the morning and rain or shine, snow, whatever, you got to go there, take care of those cows, deal with the poop, deal with the blood, sweat, tears, the smell. Neighbors are complaining that you're, you know, smelling up the place and things like that. Because the McMansion was built next to your dairy farm. All of these things have to be dealt with as well. And oh, by the way, after all that, Brazil has a bumper crop or, you know, better crop than we did, or the Russians had some disaster or whatever, or somebody else produced too much, and our prices go down. That's what's happening right now. Farm incomes are down in the last couple of years, very significant. So what does this college do in education and helping those farmers, those limited resource farmers and uh, small farmers, et cetera, put a few more dollars in their pockets so that they can indeed be profitable? And that's something that we have to be very mindful of. And you know, affordability, accessibility, et cetera, et cetera, that we need to be well, and in thinking about the sustainable uh, ecological footprint itself, the food production systems are pretty ecologically expensive. Right? Almost 80% of the consumptive use of fresh water, that's, that's the term to use, consumptive uh, use of fresh water. You know, Earth is covered, 75% of the surface is covered with salt water. You can't use it. There's only 3% of Earth's water that's fresh water, and we're using it up very quickly. The Ogallala aquifer is completely depleted. Many other aquifers. Rivers are being polluted. The Mississippi is so badly polluted in some places, like the Hudson River would be burning. The Lake Erie was burning because of pollution and things like that. And you get these algal blooms. You get the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico because of industrial pollutants, agricultural you know, runoffs and things like that, too. All of this is now needs to be dealt with. We got ammonia, we got we use almost 20% of the energy in the food that you and I consume. Okay? So we have set our goal, and this is something that you want to pay attention to, is we want to reduce that by 50% in the next 15 to 20 years. I call it a stretch goal. I don't think we're going to be able to make it, but I hope we do. With your help, people like yourselves, that are going to work on these topics, um, really are helping us address this ecological footprint that we've got. That we've got to be concerned about it. Because it goes back to, 
have an impact on climate change and on other things. Those extreme weather events, those hurricanes and tornadoes and things like that as well. And uh, so, uh, so it really requires a very new, different way of thinking. Not that uh, a cooperative animal scientist is going to sit in his little silo, he's going to work on something that he's doing, and he never talks to anybody else, that's all he's going to do. No, it, just, it takes the systems approaches, as we call it. Really think of the system. Everything from the cellular level to the organismal level to the community level. You've got to think along those lines. Anything that you can do. If you tweak something here, let's say you want to tweak a gene, that's going to have an impact on that process someplace else. Well, make sure that we're paying this all. Also, bringing together teams of individuals, even in their capacity building grants and things like that. Don't go in as the Lone Ranger saying, I'm going to figure this out. So come in with your multiple individuals working together. Maybe across universities, they're working together. Bring in your private sector partners, your non government partners. To partner with you as well. And there's also, you know, I use the word profitability every place that I can think of. Because again, those farmers, those livestock producers, gotta be profitable. If they're not profitable, they're gonna leave. They're not gonna participate in that enterprise. It's not enough to have all these PhD scientists running around making all these great discoveries. Somebody has to translate that knowledge and deliver it, i.e., extension. Somebody has to grow those crops, i.e. farmers. That's what we need as well. So this is a sort of a stream of consciousness uh, set of terminologies, you know. We need research in the area, all the you know, non-living variables, the living variables, uh, genotyping, gene editing, on and on and on. Indeed, this one I'm really intrigued by, you know. Uh, I've been thinking about this here now for the last couple of three years. Now we've gone from observational science to information science, to now pretty much making it predicted. If I put this plant or this animal in this space, in this time, it's going to do this. We're not close. I'll come in my last slide. I'll show you that the work that's, that we're providing funding for that's happening as well. That is, you as scientists can predict these sorts of things as to what's going to happen. We're not close to being able to uh, figure it out. And well, there's a the low-hanging fruit as well. In the world of food loss and food waste, this is a, an interesting graphic. But bottom line is, in developing countries in Asia and Africa, South America, about a third to half the food is lost before the dinner table. I mean, they got insect problems, pathogen problems, rodents, bats and mice, lousy storage. Uh, they got mildew. They got fungi, all manner of stuff that's destroying. About a third to half is lost. And then here in America. In Western Europe, in the developed world, we lose about a third to half the food after the dinner table. I'm looking at us collectively. To paraphrase Pogo, I've seen the enemy and it's us. We're the enemy. And in fact, the Economic Research Service, to a study, you can't read it very well in the back maybe, says that we're basically wasting, as Americans, you and I, we're wasting a third to half the food. And that translates into 133 billion with a B pounds of food per year that we waste. And that's worth 1,200 calories for a man, woman, and a child. That's what we're wasting. Oh, by the way, for adults to thrive, not to survive, to thrive, we just need 1,200 cal 2,200 calories of food. That means we're wasting half the calories that we need. Oh, by the way, of course, in America, we're number one in everything, right? We claim to be number one. We eat 4,000 calories on average. And no wonder we've got the obesity epidemic and things like that as well. But really, we're, wa we're basically wasting, and literally, we're losing $120 billion per year as Americans. I do it, you do it, you go to the restaurant, they give you this big meal, you get a small portion of it, the rest of it goes in the trash can. Okay? And uh, you go to a grocery store, and they have a sign that says, buy one pound of bananas, you're going to get three pounds of bananas free. And you know, you and I are you know, greedy. So we go ahead and pick it up. Never mind, you're only going to eat one pound, you know? Maybe two pounds. 
So you day one you eat a banana, day two you eat a banana, day three you eat a banana, and then about the fourth day of those bananas are gonna start getting a little black dots. And then the fifth day my buddies you know the the, the fruit flies will start coming in. And by day seven, it starts turning black. And so, you know, some of you will probably take that and make it the banana banana nut bread. You make so much of it, you want to give it to your neighbors. And if I'm one of your neighbors, I hate that dang thing. <laughs> I'm sure you've got neighbors that don't like it. They just take it. And then when you leave it, I throw it in the trash can, right? I've done it. I throw it in the trash can, but I hate that dang thing. And so, what happens? Then you take it, throw it in the trash can, it goes to the landfill, it starts rotting, anaerobic, you know, uh, breakdown. You get greenhouse gases, all that water that you use is gone, all the labor you use is gone, all the fertilizer you use is gone, everything's gone. In fact, the water, turns out, we're wasting, we're losing about one quadrillion liters of water. The number of quadrillion means 15 zeros. One followed by 15 zero. It's the same, it's seven times the volume of Lake Erie. That's a lot of fresh water. In fact, there's one study done that says in the year 2030, that based on today's technology, there's gonna be a shortfall of 40% of fresh water between the amount available and the amount needed. Globally, okay? That's one quadrillion liters of water. That's what we've got. And it's like taking off about 33 million cars from the streets in regards to the amount of uh, uh, greenhouse gases that are being produced as well. So that's something we can do right now, you and I collectively. And in fact, Secretary Vilsack, Tom Vilsack, and the head of uh, Administrator uh, Jim McCarthy, the head of EPA, they came up with a challenge. The food waste is not happening in our homes. It's happening in restaurants. It's happening in grocery stores. I'm sure you do it like me. When I go to the grocery store, this is the produce section. You go pick up a tomato, you want to see it's firm or something like that. Or you pick up an avocado, you want to make sure it's the right sort of firmness to it. Or an apple, you kind of pick it up and look it around, you know, you know, all that. And you don't know where that has been. It's depositing stuff on those apples and tomatoes and things like that. And it is, uh, you know, there are microbes on my hands. And uh, so what happens is, and I've also squeezed it a tad bit. You know, put a little dent in it or something, made it a little softer. And so what happens is every day, grocery stores have to dump about 10 to 50% of the produce into the landfills. Well, luckily what's happening is that there are 64 young people that created it. This is fantastic. And I'm really pleased to see this. Young people developing ideas to take that produce and this in Washington DC, University of Colorado, Maryland, College Park kids, two kids came up with the ugly fruit juice co uh, company. So they did all the ugly fruit vegetables and all that better than juice. Who cares? I mean, you don't know what, you know, juice, you'll bring it up. And uh, uh, two guys in California, they're, uh, they're distilling vodka from these bruised fruit vegetables and things like that. So I'd encourage you young people to start thinking, what can I do? You've got great uh, facilities here, by the way that you can work with, develop uh, all manner of products from these wasted foods and things like that, too. That's really, you know, pretty cool kinds of things that are happening uh, here in the United States and globally as well. And there's opportunities for the entire food chain, supply chain. And it's everything from on-farm all the way to, you know, smart refrigerators that'll tell you, you know, it'll remind you, it'll send you a signal, you know, a text message to your smartphone saying that, you know, that, uh, Packs of meat that you left way back in the back of that refrigerator is turning gray now. You better hurry up and take it out and cook it or something. <laughs> uh, we've given money to folks at uh, uh, University of Arizona. They've got shrink wraps on the meat and the produce. That's like a litmus paper test. That'll send a, a signal saying, hey, you know, eat me, eat me. <laughs> and the next generation is going to come to you, to your signal, you know, the signal to you. Because they're what are called bio-men's devices, bio-men's devices that are being developed as well. And uh, so, and we got young people, particularly, hacking food and really breaking it down into its molecular aspects. And we got companies like a young man named Joshua Tetra, he's created Hampton Creek. Uh, this guy, Rob Reinhart, he thinks the Soylent Company, he's got money from Google and from others that are putting money into him, his company, $30 million he got from venture capitalists. 
And he thinks that everybody should be eating Slurpees. So he'll put all the ingredients of the best uh, nutrients and make it a Slurpee so you just suck it up and you're all done. Well, but you know what? I think that company's gonna fail. <laughs> because food, food is a cultural aspect, right? I want to sit with my family and friends, have a nice bottle of wine, uh, maybe from Oregon, from France, the terroir, the beef, I want Argentinian beef, I want Kobe beef, I want Kansas beef, or I want, uh, uh, you know, the Washington uh, apples or whatever it is, right, the terroir. That's what we eat, and plus, I want to have a conversation with my friends and my family. Why would I want to go suck down a Slurpee or something like that? If I all I want to do is to live, then I would want a Slurpee. Otherwise, I do want to partake of life. There's this, you know, culture, cultural aspect to it as well. And we've also given money, by the way, to a number of companies at UC Davis to come up with alternatives to meat. Okay, uh, that is maybe from vegetables they can go ahead and make meat. Never mind, it costs about ten thousand dollars for a hamburger, and it doesn't really taste like a hamburger yet. But they're getting there, slowly they're getting there. Because a hamburger, that beef, you know, has, uh, you know, you know uh, fat in it, and it caramelizes it, and gives you that hamburger aroma. And so they're putting artificial aromas into that. You know, give me a break. So I, I think all these are, you know, not really viable problems. As long as humanity's around, we're still gonna grow food like this on farms. Well, yeah, maybe we'll have some vertical farms, We'll have hydroponics, we'll have aquaponics, and you know, on and on and on. But really, the bulk of it is going to be farms like we've known. Somebody's ringing. Uh, okay, food hacking. Right? There's a lot of energy in here. Precision foods. You know, a guy named Leroy Hood, Lee Hood, as he calls himself, he invented sequencing machines, you know, the genetic sequencing machines. And he came up with the idea of precision medicine about eight or ten years ago that is based on your particular genetic makeup and knowledge, you prescribe medication, so it's very highly precise. So we came up with the concept of precision foods. And because today we've got the ability to understand, in the, like for $200 you can get a genetic sequence. And along with that, the, your epigenome, your microbiome, and all that. We can do the same thing with the food that we eat, the plants and the animals that we eat as well. And there's a whole bunch of these things, these wearable technologies, right? Not just this. But we're talking about, for example, this Pixel skin. This company, is again, it's a startup. They measure your physiologic unit, your, your sweat. You can measure what you've got, what your nutrient status is, what your electrolyte status is, your you know, breathing, your you know, on and on. Everything is being picked up, the temperature, et cetera. And you know, based on food analysis, lifestyle, behaviors, and all that, you can almost prescribe the kind of food. So if you live in California, you have a certain lifestyle, you know, it's outdoorsy lifestyle and all that, you eat certain kinds of food. If you live in Minnesota, you get a different kind of food. Totally that's different. So it's based on these sort of precise knowledge that we can generate as well. We're, we're getting it, canalizing the coast to be able to do that as well. And in fact, if you look at USDA, we've got this thing called Super Tracker, they can keep track snap for your smartphone. You can keep track of everything that you're doing and it's iteratively getting better and better and better of taking all manner of data into it as well. And so really we're thinking of these systems approaches that we want to develop sustainable land quality systems, everything from productivity to the environment to nutrition and food safety to the bioeconomy itself. And uh, all of it though is driven by data science. Big data is the term that we hear everywhere. So in October of last year, I hosted a summit, a big data summit. Apple Computer, Google, IBM folks, et cetera, and universities and, and the government, et cetera, they all came to Chicago to have a conversation. We're providing right now $11 million in grants, grant opportunities, for y'all to come up with ideas on what you want to do with big data. I don't know what it is that you should be doing. Turns out many of you don't know what it is that needs to be done too. What, what, what does big data mean? And we want to find out. So we're providing $11 million right now. And we're going to provide more and more money for big data because there's some pretty tantalizing possibilities of data mining and doing things that we've never been able to do before that can happen right now. And I, you know, I can go on and on about that. I've, I've spoken about that as well. But I want to stop there to say that there are a lot of smart systems that are being developed. 
and the smart system and intuitive side of the physical system. We're partnering with the National Science Foundation to provide money for robots and drones that can be used in uh, you know, various food production environments. Robots because you know, labor is just a problem. We have lousy immigration laws in this country. And agriculture is one of the most labor intensive uh, efforts that we've got. So, uh, sensors, biomems and biomensors. These are bi hybrids between biological and nano electromechanical <coughs> and, uh, bio and micro electromechanical <coughs> systems. We gave money to June Crawford at, uh, uh, at Colorado State University, and she's created these things, you know, biomensor devices that will be sitting on the plant, and if it gets hit by a spore of a pathogen, it sends a signal to your smartphone saying, come spray something or take care of me, I'm, I'm getting sick from this disease. And uh, plus, what's happening, and you know, we believe that this is possible from the farm to the dinner table, by the way. And, and we want, you know, your ideas on how to go about uh, investing the resources to make all these discoveries that we need. 21st century farm, it looks like any other farm, right? And uh, it's not everything but a farm would have tractors and barns and, you know, other things, silos and that. Except it's got lots of these. These sensors. The average farm in America today, they have several thousand sensors detecting moisture, detecting nitrogen, detecting pathogens, weeds, and things like that, too. It's pretty amazing the kind of stuff that's going on. And we've got you know, funding that we provided to this one from UC Davis and University of Illinois and Iowa State and other places. Robots that go around the field, they're going down, they can tell the difference between a weed plant and not the smoking kind of weed. <laughs> and a strawberry plant. They tell the difference between those. And, if, and they have algorithms, they have detectors, they have, you know, visual detectors. Pretty soon they're going to have the sense of smell. And other you know, tactile detectors or sensors as well. Once the decision is made that it is a weed plant, it's got a laser on it, it'll deploy the laser to zap that weed plant. You don't have to deploy a herbicide or whatever. Or, it sends a signal to a drone. A drone can come and then very nicely, precisely drop pesticide right where that is needed, not throughout the field. So you're going to save money of not wasting your pesticides you're dropping as well. And these are available now, by the way, commercially. Monsanto and John Deere and other companies are starting to sell these things. A lot of the research is stuff that is being sold is based on the research that NIFA and NSF and others have provided funding for as well. Department of Defense, DARPA, ARPA-E, all these have provided funding for. And this is the best part. You know, I remember what I was talking about how the average uh, uh, yield is 180 bushels per acre or so in that graphic that I showed you. This guy, Randy Dowdy, he's a young man from uh, Georgia. A couple of years ago, he grew 500 bushels of corn per acre. The average that year was 170. Imagine the possibilities. <coughs> how much less land you need, how much less water you need, how much less labor you need. Pretty much all that based on genetics, and big data, sensors, and all of it coming together. That's where you get the That's what the, the possibilities are. That we're you know, really pushing with the knowledge that you folks like you are generating. We're pushing the perverted level uh, forward. So what that is doing really is we want to invest money in increasing, you know, whether it's water use efficiency, nitrogen use efficiency, or the nutrient status, or photosynthesis. We're really interested in it. Diversifying, we want to diversify the crops and the animals that we consume. And we want to protect, obviously, you know, best management and things like that are really, really important. Because, again, with globalization and all that, we're seeing all manner of new things. With climate change, we're seeing all manner of new things coming in. Zika virus, right? Who would have thunk it? There was no Zika virus. Suddenly, is here in Louisiana, in Texas, the other ones start seeing people having babies with microcephaly and being infected with Zika virus and things like that. You gotta do something about protecting our interests, right? And then developing and deploying, you know, we gotta get it out in the field. We gotta deploy it, that knowledge that you're generating. And also, we wanna prepare the future of our nation as well, the young people that are sitting in this audience, the young people that you educate. We want them to become scientists, of course. We want them to get into the extension arena. 
for them to uh, work as uh, professionals in the food and agricultural enterprise. And we want them to also go into the farming enterprise because we need that as well, as I was saying earlier. And uh, so, you know, I was talking about predictive science, going from observational science to information science to predictive science. These projects are allowing us to do that. This we partner with NSF and ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Products uh, Agency. DARPA, D-A-R-P-A, is the Defense Advanced Research Products Agency. They're the inventors of the internet. Okay, they did it back in the early 1960s. And all manner of things that you can think of, they invented those. Drones, they invented those. And uh, so we're partnering and really trying to understand every little detail of what that plant or animal does in its environment, different environment. So we give money to Purdue, to uh, Texas A&M, to uh, University of Arizona. They got drones, they got uh, tractor mounted, they've got gantry mounted. Every second of every day of the life of that plant or of that cow or that pig is being imaged and picked up, it's weight, it's breathing, it, the amount of carbon that's producing, every second. Imagine the amount of data that you're gonna get from it. And they're doing it in multiple environments. And the idea is the same genetics, it's the exact same genetics, but in different environments. And based on it, and now they've got, you know, they got these little, in the roots, they got worm bots. These worm bots are like little worms, they're going around looking at the roots. How the root respond to the bacteria? The insects are doing this. All that's going to allow us to really be able to predict if I were to take this genetics and put it in this context, in this environment, I can predict this yield I'm going to get. That's what's happening. It's pretty amazing. And oh, by the way, this is going to become, you know, obviously, as this evolves, it's going to become of relevance to limited resource farmers and others as well. Those, those sensors, are things like that. every bit as important to a limited resource farmer because he or she may not have the money to go and use a pesticide unless it's absolutely needed. If you got the sensors, you know, they gotta water those plants. Well, why waste your water? You know, put it on a sprinkler system and you know, keep sprinkling away. Do it with sensors and things like that. The cost of these things are dropping down. We want it to come down to less than a cent, a penny per sensor. That's what where the research is that we need, desperately need as well. So everybody in particular. And this last slide, really, I don't know if anyone of you has read Ray Kurzweil, K-U-R-Z-W-E-I-L. Ray Kurzweil is a futurist, and he works for Google. And Ray Kurzweil wrote this book called Singularity. He came up with the term singularity. That is, everything, all this knowledge that we're generating, is all going to come together to transcend boundaries, limits. And I, you know, I thought, you know, I think it's a convergence of singularities is more appropriate than saying. And all the work that's going on in the world of biotechnology, cognitive sciences, unmanned aero system, sensor, the internet, hardware, software, cognitive computing, nanotechnology, data analytics, imaging, etc. All of this has come together. And to be able to transcend whatever limits there are. And uh, like Randy Daddy, the young man, the farmer from Georgia being able to grow 500 bushels of corn per acre. It's a pretty mind-boggling uh, statistic to think of. But we also got to be worried about the angst that people have. You know, the, the food bank, Rush Limbaugh and others that are driving the conversation as well. Policies, public pressure, regulations, and things like that. All of this, obviously, is really important to think of. And really, at the end of the day, this is what's important. All the greatest gizmos, you know, in the world mean nothing at all if you don't worry about people. It's people that make decisions. In fact, with GMOs, with DDT, we thought we had these magic bullets, but they didn't turn out to be magic bullets. We've got all manner of unintended consequences. So we need the social scientists, the sociologists, the anthropologists, the folks that work in the human dimensions, not just uh, animal scientists and uh, entomologists and uh, engineers and such, right? We want the social scientists. And as you're thinking uh, uh, of you know, hiring new people that want to come here and work with your young you know, students and such, you want to think of those social scientists as well. Because 
We got to get a grounding. That at the end of the day, humans make decisions. And we've got to bring people along as well because we're ready to get all the money we're investing in all these gizmos and things that mean nothing uh, if you can't bring people along. So that's what's important. But I'm very optimistic that that existential threat that I refer to, we're going to lick it. Thank you very much. Two or three questions, then I gotta split. I gotta go to New Orleans for a uh, meeting. Yeah, so the question is what's the role of social scientists and behavioral scientists? They're critically important, they gotta be front and center. And because for far too long we've been thinking that somehow these biologists and these engineers and others are gonna figure out. You know, that's why I'm very concerned, with all due respect to this guy, about STEM education. Very concerned because we think that somehow we're going to become, everybody will become a STEM education person, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we're going to become technicians. You know what? The Chinese and the Indians are much better at it than you and I can ever be. What keeps America out of the game is this, the, the critical thinking, problem solving, you know, trying to see way out of the head. Uh, the folks around the world can look at the inventions that are made here, that can be taken and, and you know, imitated, copied, made better, and all that. But it really comes down to that critical thinking, problem solving skills and things. That's where social science and behavioral science is really important. Communication skills. So that needs to be front and center. So use our comparative advantage is what I'm You got it. You got to use our comparative So don't get on this bandwagon saying, me too, I want to do STEM education. But think of the construct of who we are as an institution of higher learning. That's what we're called an institution of higher learning. Not that we want to be technicians. STEM education. Sorry, Chancellor. We talked about STEM this morning and, and about how we don't have these subjects that are, you know, agricultural subjects that are part of the STEM education enterprise. Okay, one last question, please. Okay. All right, there you go, Vanessa, right? Yeah. Okay. Once you get the, everyone to work with the food chain anywhere, it could be, you know, um, nutritionists for everyone, how, with whom we'll work with the grocery stores to stop putting the junk food on sale rather than the nutritional food? Yeah, right. Because that's what a lot of people who's not making a lot of money, that's what they're able to buy. Sure. You know, processed foods, junk foods, juices, sweets, and all of that. No. Yep. So, but the question is, you know, who's going to work with? You know, we're going to be working with the scientists and educators and all that. We're going to work with the grocery stores and others. Again, you and I have to do that. We have to help craft the policies and the regulations and things like that. But then we'll filter to through the grocery manufacturers' association. So USDA will work with the grocery manufacturers' association, with the convenience store folks and others as well to to help them think through what these policies might want to be from a food safety perspective, from an obesity perspective. In fact, the Institute of Medicine a few years ago said we've got to have a lot less salt and sugar, a lot less processed foods and all that. It's percolating now down to the grocery stores as well. In fact, you know, General Mills and Kellogg's and them are you know, starting to change how they process food, putting a lot less salt and sugar and things like that too. So it's happening, but again, you and I and collectively have to help develop the knowledge and make that available so you can inform the policy makers and the decision. You know, your legislature, Congress, and others have to be informed with science-based information. All right, I gotta run. If you're a quiet person like me, send me an email. I'll, I'll answer your questions. Sunny, S-O-N-N-Y, nefa.usda.gov. Send me an email. Yeah. I do get several, two to three hundred emails a day that I deal with, okay? But I promise you I'll reply. Often within 24 hours, but sometimes a little bit later. But I will reply. Send your emails. Thanks very much. Good luck. You know me. Ask me any questions about funding or anything like that, and I'll point you in the right direction. Okay? Good luck to you, and I tip of my hat to you. You're doing what? Thank you.